Alternative power sources and new propulsion methods are key differentiators for a new wave of aircraft intended for new modes of transportation that some are calling advanced air mobility. Electric motors, batteries and fuel cells are key components of this approach. And to get a clear idea of how these technologies are joining up the dots, we've asked industry expert Sergio Chikuta to explain how they're making a difference. The benefits of an electric motor as compared to the power plant that we usually use in aviation, whether it's uh, an ICE, an internal combustion engine, or it is uh, um, a turbine, is that there is a significant reduction in the moving parts. Uh, and therefore, it is an increase in simplicity, a decrease in maintenance cost, uh, and, and a higher MTBF. The manufacturers are uh, spending more and more time increasing the power density of these configurations. Uh, we started at about seven kilowatt per kilogram, and now we're reaching seven and a half with peaks all the way to 15. Uh, why are these electric motor um, and uh, an enabler and unlocking for configuration we didn't think about before? The reason is what people have heard many times is called distributed propulsion. And the reason is each motor is self-contained and doesn't need any more the transmissions and all of the other mechanical complexity that comes with conventional aircraft, much less with conventional helicopters. The automotive sector has paved the way for electric power, but there are important differences when it takes to the air. The motors that we see in aircraft are similar to the motors that we see in cars. Um, let's call it, uh, they can be cousins. Uh, they're not brothers, and why do I say they're not brothers? Um, power density is very important. So the power density for the motors that we have in eVTOL, or let's call it um, aircraft application, is double uh, what is the EV motor. And the reason is the weight is extremely important for aerospace application. It's less important for car application. Uh, in this case, for example, one of the most advanced motor is a motor that is on a Lucid Air car. It's a brand new startup uh, out of Casa Grande in California, where the motor is the size of a toaster and it produces enough power for a car of the name of like Lamborghini or a Ferrari. And yet it is very, very small. And this is the kind of motor that we, uh, we're striving for in aerospace with also the understanding that Different from internal combustion engine, um, electric motor can also provide significantly higher amount of power for peak period or very short period, as opposed to combustion motors where the production of power is completely different. Batteries are where the power lies, but how does the electricity get to where it's needed? We can start integrating a motor uh, or, uh, or, or a turbine or an ice motor with um, an electric motors and battery. And in that point, we're talking about a hybrid or we can go fully electric in which we have a battery pack that interfaces with a motor. And the way that we have to think about it, it's a little bit like a cell phone. Uh, we have batteries in the cell phone. We have batteries in these aircraft. In a cell phone, the battery powers the screen and all of the chips needed for you to be able to do all of the uh, application on your cell phone. In this case, the battery discharged their power into the motors and all of the subsystem to make sure the airplane flies. When we look at a battery, we look at two pieces. We look at energy density and power density. Um, and let's start with defining which is which. Energy density is how much energy you can store. So how much water goes in your glass. And instead, the power density is how much power, how much energy you can output from the battery. So imagine is how fast are you drinking your glass of water? Um, and, and that is very important because batteries um, have, are very susceptible to high uh, rate of charging and discharging. Uh, and, and that is what can shorten uh, the life of the battery. So many times you hear watt per kilogram, and in that case, we're talking about power density, or you hear watt hour per kilogram, and in that case, you're talking about energy density. So when we talk about the 200 kilowatt batteries, we're really talking about a 200 kilowatt hour battery. But when you're talking about a motor, and you talk about a 300 kilowatt motor, 
you're not talking about a measure of energy, you're talking about a measure of power. And some of these new aircraft are using fuel cells. The fuel cell, it's not a battery, but it is, um, it's another way to produce electricity. So, for example, in a battery, it's, imagine, it's, it's again with our glass of water. It's just a glass of water we need to put water in. In case of this uh, fuel cell, the water is literally produced by another piece that's called a fuel cell. Uh, and actually, the funny thing, it's the byproduct of a fuel cell is water. Um, that's why they're very much used on spacecrafts. Um, and the idea here is a fuel cell converts chemical energy of hydrogen into electricity. And then the electricity still needs to be stored in a battery. But the idea is that the battery now needs to be significantly smaller. Why? Because you're basically carrying your energy producing facility with you as opposed to be on the ground. There are limits to the amount of available power, and this means aircraft developers have to assess how to make the best of these limitations. When it comes to um, a battery-powered aircraft, I think what helps is try to make a comparison with existing aircraft. Um, it is easy to look at any veto because there is not a point of comparison. So let's look, for example, an A320 or an A330 what would be the amount of energy needed to move one of those airplanes? And we're talking 20 megawatts for an A320 and 40 megawatts for an A330. To give you an idea, a power plant like the one that you might have outside your city produces one gigawatt, so 1,000 megawatts. So we're talking about level of energy that is uh, beyond what we can, uh, we can uh, transport, uh, fly basically. So when it comes to these, batteries right now are the limiting factor for specific mission. That's why it's very dependent on use cases. And it's the reason why we can look at, uh, for example, metal mile logistic for cargo or at this urban mission for urban air mobility as two missions that right now are able to live within the uh, I wouldn't even call it a limitation, but within the envelope of the performance of the current batteries. The reason for going all electric, it's, it's dictated by many times uh, environmental considerations, um, as well, especially in Europe, in the US, in most of the advanced countries where this move toward electrification is very important. When the new electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft enter service, Operators will need to have a good system for recharging batteries in order to maximize efficiency while ensuring safety. Discharging and charging a battery, it's, it's very important for the life of the battery. Uh, all batteries are, life of the battery is measured in cycles. That is one of the reasons why if you own an iPhone, now there is a battery management page where it tells you how much life of the battery it has. Uh, and when it says, for example, that your battery is only 80% of the original life, it means that 20% of the physical capacity of the battery is forever gone. Um, when it comes to, um, to charging in this, char in, in, in this aircraft, number one, we're talking batteries, as we said before, between 200 kilowatt hour packs and 350 kilowatt hour. But we're also talking about rates of charging that are significantly higher than anything we see in uh, electric cars today. Most electric cars charge between 100 and 150 kilowatt per hour. Um, but the truth is you go all the way to up to 270, new uh, architecture go to 350. Uh, but there is a new level of charging that's been introduced for semi trucks, where it goes to megawatts of power of charging. And so when it comes to the batteries for this kind of aircraft, we can assume an infrastructure that will look more like what is expected for freight truck uh, delivery vehicles than what we see today with cars. Swapping batteries as opposed to recharging batteries, it's actually an interesting issue that has been also dealt by the car industry. Uh, and to give an example with the car industry, we have two big companies that are kind of in different philosophies. You have Tesla, where it's battery charging as fast as possible. You have NIO, where one of the, it's a Chinese startup uh, for electric vehicles, where they're, uh, one of the key differentiators is the fact that they can swap the battery pack. 
So swapping battery packs is feasible. However, it requires specific design of the aircraft. For example, some aircraft they have their batteries low under the vehicle, and that allows, for example, to swap a battery pack. However, because these battery packs many times are structural or integral part of the vehicle, the swap is more seen as an easier way to do maintenance than as a way to increase range or decrease charging times. However, many aircraft manufacturers are placing batteries in as close as possible to the motors so that they don't have to run a lot of cabling because you can imagine this is high voltage so cables can be quite large uh, and therefore batteries can be placed in wings uh, and that makes it now the battery structural or part the integral part of the structure of the aircraft and difficult uh, to pull out and you always have to imagine that while for cars the having batteries as close to the ground as possible is an advantage for aircraft it's not the same today's battery management systems are very advanced uh, and can talk to the infrastructure it already happens in cars uh, where the, the the smart charging unit knows exactly the battery state of charge and everything else and so uh, actually in new cars there is some uh, new cars that are introducing a completely wireless BMS where there is actually it's all wireless talking between this battery management system and the battery and so we can imagine something high tech for this aircraft as well where the entire fleet knows exactly how much charge is there uh, and the other thing we also have to think is that these batteries for aircraft um, they will require higher safety margin than for cars so in a car you have a battery let's say that the battery is 100 and you can you are only going to say that 90 of this 100 is utilizable uh, why because you want to maintain a certain margin as far as the life of the battery for an aircraft on top of that you will have to add the fact that there is reserves and then last but not least um, professor Carnegie Mello I think made uh, an awesome statement it says uh, landing and taking off for any veto is like going ludicrous mode instead for three seconds for 60 to 90 seconds and so you need to make sure that especially in the landing you will have that enough energy and capacity to land safely the aircraft but there have been some concerns over the use of batteries in aircraft, with a number of fires raising doubts about how safe they are. So let's start with understanding why do batteries catch fire? Because it's, it's really interesting. If you look at a battery, you shake it, it seems solid. So what, what's catching fire? And the truth is in lithium ion batteries, that is what we call batteries today, um, there is a liquid electrolyte. Basically, it's a fluid that moves these energy, let's call it, between the plus and the minus inside the battery. And this liquid can have, uh, if, if you know that when a liquid turns into a gas, its volume increases significantly. And therefore, that's the worry of what they call thermal runaway, is that these cells, once the um, electrolyte becomes gaseous, increases significantly in size breaches the battery cell and then it can affect close battery, other battery cells and then start a fire. So the way that they've done it is number one, they have made sure that each battery cells and each battery pack is physically uh, separated from the others so that in case of a thermal runway event is uh, contained in a specific cell. Number two, they've made sure that there is venting in case that there is a thermal runway event and there is gas. And last but not least, this, what they, you will hear them more and more called BMS, battery management system, are getting more and more sophisticated and can understand the chemistry of the entire battery cell level and can avoid this uh, thermal runaway issue. In fact, the industry is already seeing beyond the limitations of existing lithium ion batteries. The lithium ion chemistry has some limits, um, like every technology, always towards the end of the life of technology we eke more and more gains however these gains are percentage points we're not talking about order of magnitude changes and if at a certain point we want batteries to become more of an alternative to fuels we need to go this extra step 
Um, what right now is seen as the next venue for batteries, the next step for batteries, it's what they call solid state batteries. And the idea is that the liquid electrolyte doesn't exist anymore and the entire battery is solid. Um, and uh, there is different chemistries like pure lithium or graphite or even air. There is batteries that are lithium air uh, where at this point eliminating the fluid reduces significantly the problem of fires. And what's the other part? There is more advantages. There is the advantage that now we're talking before we were talking about two to three hundred uh, watt hour per kilogram. These batteries were talking even more than 500 watt hour per kilograms. Um, we're talking a, a capacity of going from zero to 80 percent in 15 minutes. The last part is we're also talking about a battery that maintains 80 percent of its capacity after 800 cycles. And so imagine a cycle, a charge and discharge. It's a cycle. Now imagine doing 800 cycle and have 80 percent to put an idea. Um, during the average life of a cell phone over uh, what we can say two to three years, you're talking about 800 to 1100 cycles with a cell phone that is used. So we're talking about charging once a day. So the time frame for this battery is actually very interesting in which in laboratory and in small numbers, we can do it. Um, however, it's different from producing a lot of batteries. So every time you talk about Tesla, you hear about these Giga factories and the Giga stands for gigawatts that they can assemble. So billions of watts that they can put together. And so right now, uh, while there is already a bus in the Mercedes product line, the Citaro, that actually sold, it's an electric bus sold with solid state batteries um, that have limitations. Uh, their limitation is that the charging is more complex and slower. However, they are smaller batteries that have a higher density. Um, for aircraft, it, the batteries for aircraft is even one order of magnitude more complex than a battery for a ground vehicle. And we will see um, some of these battery come. Uh, for example, for the 2020 Olympics, now 2021 Olympics in Tokyo, uh, Toyota was going to and is going to show a solid state battery car. And so we see the solid state battery probably entering the arena of being a possible replacement for lithium ion in the latter part of this decade. So call it 26 to 30. Uh, so we also see that if an eVTOL is being designed for entry into service toward the latter part of the decade, you could also start to assume that that vehicle might be powered by solid state batteries. So what I take from Sergio is that electric propulsion remains a work in progress. But this isn't holding back the early adopters who are not willing to wait for perfection to happen. And on the question of all electric or hybrid electric, well, really, that comes down to what missions you feel will be the most significant and profitable. More recently, hydrogen has come into focus as another way to produce electricity to power aircraft. And we're going to take a closer look at that concept in another of these Future Flight Explainer videos. AIN's new futureflight.aero platform is drilling down to make sense of the new aviation technologies and business models. We're posting fresh news day by day, and subscribers get access to exclusive stories about what's happening throughout the industry, and also to our extensive database of new aircraft programs and the companies behind them. You can subscribe for free to our weekly newsletter, which brings you highlights from the Future Flight world every Thursday. So thanks for watching this video, and please do find more of our coverage at futureflight.aero.